And welcome to everyone joining us live this evening, for the first of our public program events for Yorkshire Sculpture International. My name is Jane Boyru. I'm the producer for Yorkshire Sculpture International. I use the pronoun she, her. I'm mixed race with shortish dark brown hair. And I'm in my home in Leeds with blue walls, books and pictures behind me. We have a BSL interpreter, Laura, who's with us and will be visible throughout. And live captioning can be turned on by clicking on the CC button in the bottom right hand side of your screen. I firstly wanted to introduce the program. Yorkshire Sculpture International is a uniquely collaborative project between Henry Moore Institute, Leeds Art Gallery, the Hepworth Wakefield and Yorkshire Sculpture Park. Spanning the poor partner venues, the partnership celebrates Yorkshire as the home of sculpture in the UK. Supported by funding from Arts Council England, Leeds 2023 and Wakefield Council, we've been able to commission four brilliant early career artists based here in Yorkshire. Akila Bertram, Clay Bowler, Wando Obezi, and Ashley Holmes. We are delighted to open this year's programme with Akila Bertram, who is presenting Return at Yorkshire Sculpture Park until the 1st of August, which is produced by York Medial. Akila will be talking more about this incredibly moving interactive sculpture installation later. Welcome, Akila. Hi, Akila. Hi. Um, is going to introduce herself in a minute. Born in 1990 in London, Akila is a cross-disciplinary artist who lives and works in Leeds. She's interested in collective narratives, challenging perspectives and innovating modes of communication. Akila produces work across new media art, interactive design, sculpture and performance, exploring heritage and identity through creative technology. Akila questions identity narratives by reflecting on the lived experience of the African diaspora and what a world without borders would look like. Akila has exhibited nationally and internationally since studying at the University of Leeds, the Hochschule für Bedelnde Kunst in Dresden and the Royal College of Art in London. Akila is currently the Gatenby Fellow in Contemporary Art at the University of Leeds. We're excited also to introduce Susan Butler to be in conversation with Akila. Hi, Susan. Welcome. Susan Butler is a writer, artist, dramaturg and lecturer in performance studies and creative writing. She thinks a lot about youth and old age, solitude and community, negotiations with hope and what it means to look forward to an increasingly wily future. Susan's current work in progress explores bodies and identities in constant motion, crossing borders, heading from crash to crash. Her recent artwork has appeared at the Baltic, Tate Exchange, the Latvian National Museum in Riga, Hotel Maria Capel in the Netherlands. Season's debut novel, Signet, was published in spring 2019 and won the Writers Guild 2020 Award for the best first novel. Little plug here, <laughs> that a paper paperback edition is out in North America on August 24th. Season lives and works between London and Berlin, she has an installation showing at the Zürcher Theatre Spectacle called Quid, Quid Pro Quo, which is part of Vlatko Horvat's and Tim Etchell's piece, Not Standing in Place. Please note that if you wish to ask any questions, then please leave them in the Q&A um, Q section, the buttons below. And these will be picked up by Akila and Susan during the talk. I will now hand over to you both to introduce yourselves and begin the conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, yeah, it was really lovely. My name's Akila Bertram. My pronouns are she, her. I am a black woman with Afro hair and I'm in a room with a bookshelf to one side of me and some plants in the background to the other side of me. And I'm Susan Butler. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I am a mixed race black woman with a short curly afro and a dark blue wall behind me. Okay. All right. And um, in addition to the other things that Jane said that I am, I'm also a really huge fan of Akila's work. And I'm so pleased to uh, have this chance to talk publicly with Akila uh, about 
this work return, um, but also a, a practice that I've admired for several years. So Thank this you. is a real treat for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so Akila, do you want to kick off by talking to us a little bit about the commission and, um, and about mm -hmm. uh, Return itself as an artwork? Yes, yeah, so Return is an interactive installation. It began life in 2019 following a residency with the studio Invisible Flock. Um, and Will, we can have a look at the first video because I think it's easier maybe to see it than to hear me explain it. Um, effectively, what it consists of are two parallel installations. Um, and on each side of the installation, a connect sensor picks up your hand movements and turns them into light waves. Um, so as you can see or in the video that's playing at the moment, there's people waving their hands and gesturing. And as a result, there are waves of blue and white light appearing on the surface of the installation on the floor. Um, and this was the beginning of a technical inquiry about how people in different places could experience a sense of connection, of playfulness, but also of a joint experience that somehow managed to physically cross the distance that was between them. So in this video, there are two sites that the installation is working on, um, the Town Hall in Leeds and the Tetley, which is a gallery space in Leeds as well. Um, so from there, the project really evolved into thinking about the African diaspora. Um, if we were to erect different installations around the world in our different locations that allowed people just have a sense of shared um, place, shared physicality. What would those installations look like? What would they become? And who would be involved in the production of them? And so the current commission, um, that, that was in 2019. The current commission is picking up where that work left off after a hiatus because of COVID. And um, with this commission, and we can have a look at the second video, thanks, Will. Um, I've picked the research back up again, and this stage is not just looking at the technology and what it does, but it's beginning to think about the aesthetics, what the experience is, what people might see, hear, and feel. Um, so the exhibition is taking place at Yorkshire Sculpture Park in the Bothy Gallery. Um, it involves three rooms. In the first room, there are some laser cut maps looking at the locations where African enslaved people were taken from and sent to. Um, across the Western Hemisphere. Um, it is, has a room where connect sensors are used to map a point cloud of your body. So this kind of looks like um, a very pixelated version of yourself, um, which you're able to use your hand with a sensor to freeze and rotate in space. Um, it also involves work by a recent graduate, Carmen Okoma, who has who had commissioned to look at some of the, the records of the slave journals um, and take out some of the names, some of the only names that were present and, and look at ways how we start to think about them and itemize them. And where do we go from there really was the question with that commission. And in the third room, there's a light wall um, consisting of laser cut plywood and LED strips. And as you walk into the room, the light will follow you and respond to movements in your hands and in the floor there are a series of transducers um, which at the moment are just playing audio but as it's an exhibition in progress a work in progress um, we'll be looking at how they become augmented by people's presence as well in the later weeks um, so that kind of takes us to today where the project is physically <laughs> what it's doing physically at the moment thanks for that kind of overview. Um, so I, I first encountered your work when you had uh, another kind of work in progress going, um, your really beautiful interactive installation, Ultiverse. And um, I was so, so drawn to your practice in the way that you use um, digital and the body um, and managed to make these experiences very kind of um, technically fascinating, um, mm. but also sort of irresistible to interact with and to sort of be with. Um, and so 
I was wondering if you could like tell us a little bit about um, how the work works. Um, you know, sort of you mentioned kind of sensors and um, mm -hmm. transducers. So mm -hmm. um, would you mind kind of just geeking out a little bit for us? I can try. I'm going to full disclosure. I work with a brilliant technologist called Simon Fletcher. Um, and typically our work process begins with me going, Fletch, I think it'd be really great if we, I don't know, hatched eggs on Mars and he goes, okay, great. Yeah, we can, we can look at doing that. Um, so with this exhibition, um, we've used Connect sensors. Um, so if anybody's ever used an Xbox Connect um, to play golf or bowling or whatever, um, it's a sensor that uses infrared to pick up your body and create a, an outline of a body. Um, and that we've used in the past a program called Touch Designer to create different programming instructions about what happens when you move your hand, what happens when you move around in a space. In this particular installation, the connect, the data from the connect has been used in a program called Open Frameworks um, to map where you are in a, in a space physically and to create a 3D trace and imprint of your movements and what you've done. Um, at the current status, the, the installation is able to record a few seconds um, of your movement and that in turn will transform into an image which I can share now actually, might be a bit easier. Um, lots of bit of illustration. So this is a trace, is that coming through okay? I can see it. Okay, great. Um, so this is a trace of me walking through space. Um, and so what, what has happened is at each point in time where I've moved to a different place, the Connect sensors have, have created an imprint of where I've been using this dust-like um, aesthetic, which is a point cloud of, of all the different points I've occupied in 3D space. Um, and as a result, we're able to, to trace where somebody has been and generate this imagery. So that's technically one of the things that the sensors are doing. Um, we've added in another sensor, which is called a leap motion. Again, it's using infrared, um, but this, this sensor has been developed specifically to look at people's hands and create a skeleton of people's hands. And using the leap motion with the point cloud, you, you are able to turn this image around in, in digital 3D space and zoom into it and you know, spin it and, and kind of, um, make that digital form a bit more tangible. Um, and then with the with the light wall, again, it's using a connect sensor, which in this image where we have um, a wavy wall with lights behind it, wavy wall made of wooden strips with lights behind it, there's a connect sensor at the top. It will track where you are. And um, this is using Touch Designer now to, to use your body to generate a video feed of this cloud of lights that follow you around and as you gesture becomes bigger and more animated um, and responds to your body. So that's that's like an overview of what the sensors are doing and how they're translating in the body. I just I find this work incredibly stunning and um, it's almost as though after the decades and centuries of work that we've had in various forms that respond to the African diaspora and to these um, histories of enslavement and captivity, um, you do manage to kind of grasp in single images and also in the kind of ongoing interaction that installation can provide something that I feel really gets to the heart of things in a way that I've just not seen before. Mm. Um, and, and which does remind me of some other practice, um, which we like may have time to, to bring in and mm. discuss a little bit later. Um, but I do want to uh, stay, with, stay with return and stay with this work for a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm interested in the way that the work changed for you um, with the onset of the pandemic, uh, because it, it really does seem to have had um, a, a really poignant significance before. And, um, and I, I wonder maybe how that changed as the world shifted and the idea of um, using the digital to reach each other became more imperative to more people. 
definitely I think that's a really a really great summary so um in 2017 I visited Jamaica for the first time which is where my parents are from and it was the first time they'd returned in 50 years and it felt like wow this is a really significant physical step and journey to make the following year in 2018 I visited Ghana it was my first time on the continent my first time you know seeing an aspect of my history that was extremely ambiguous but also very familiar um and I just felt that those those journeys and the limits of not being able to make those journeys prior to that time um was a really important thing to address um also within my family it's it, I have family in America in Jamaica um in Canada and we're constantly using Skype or FaceTime or WhatsApp video call to to keep in touch and to to form a sense of presence and it's it's really difficult when there's an illness or a death and you're thinking, oh my God, I can't be there. Um, and so that has that's been like a backdrop to to my approach to telepresence and why it's necessary. And then obviously when we had the pandemic and suddenly we're zooming classrooms and um we're, we're zoom calling with friends that live down the street because we're on a lockdown. And um yeah, it, w- it was very interesting to see this very heightened awareness around people who are usually able to be mobile and for people who have the privilege of being able to move around freely that we now need to communicate in a very different way. Um, I think that was, it, not that it was nice because obviously there's many terrible aspects of the pandemic, but it, it, it was just, um, I suppose it made the project easier to, to, to say to people, oh, it's really important that we're able to have a sense of connection across time and space. and now it, it just makes sense to people because they've experienced that distance and what the the lack of closeness can do to a relationship. And the um, the Black Atlantic represents this massive fissure, this break, and this kind of forced disconnect uh, between people. And one thing that I've always admired about your work is the way that it does seem to inspire uh, community and collaboration. Um, every time I've encountered your work, it's really been in a setting where um, folks are there to contribute to it, to add something to it, both your direct artistic collaborators, but also the community of people who whose bodies and whose presence provide the data that makes the work go, that makes it all work. And, um, and when I look at the list of collaborators that have worked with you, even just on Ultraverse, um, such as the poet Zadwa Niyodi, um, Akeem Buck, um, Omari Swanson Jeffords. It's almost like a who's who among young West Yorkshire artists. And um, so I, I wanted to kind of touch on what community and togetherness means in the making of your work, which tends to be, it, which tends to feel to me like it's it's always in progress. Um, there's a certain like softness to it um, in terms of not being fixed and finished and exhibited, but um, work that is constantly making and, and making and making. Yeah, and I think I think it's incredibly important on a number of levels, and you, you're right to identify that. I have a real resistance to a work being finished or fixed or frozen in time, um, mostly because I feel like I'm just going to change my mind. Like it, it's it's bound to evolve. Why would I try and freeze it? Um, a lot of the work I feel are a part of me, and I am a part of a community or I'm a part of a wider experience, and. I'm I'm not necessarily interested in parading my own personal experience as as an I don't know a pinnacle or an archetype of what it is to be Black British or what it is to be whatever identity has been explored in the work. Um, I think identities exist in relationship, and so it just makes sense from a, a thematic point of view that the work would be created in relationship and in a community and even if it's just with the input and the feedback of other people. From a practical point of view, I'm making interactive installations. I love to see that moment when somebody walks in a room and realizes that they've had an influence in a space or recognize that if they were absent, the work wouldn't be the same. 
Um, and so from a practical point of view, I actually need I need people to be involved. I need to see them as the work is developing, using it, utilising it. So even, even now with Return Up at, at Yorkshire Sculpture Park, during the week you know I sit on a bench outside and people don't know I've made it and I'm listening to what they're saying and I'm I'm like gleaning information about how the work needs to develop really and how it's touching people in different ways and that's really important and I don't think it'll ever not be a part of the work that I make because it's really intrinsic to them. So I also want to pick up on um, the notion of borders and the body and um, your interest in imagining a world without borders or um, certain ways that we can challenge the notion of borders and the kind of nation state model that we live under at the moment. And uh, yeah, so could you speak to the way these ideas inform your work and your practice? Yeah, so um, again, it, it goes back to my family and um, hearing people all my life refer to back home as not England, basically, um, even though I'm born here and for the first 12 years of my life, I never left this country. So, but to, to conceptualize and emotionally relate to somewhere I'd never been to um, as a part of the structure of my identity, um, it felt very borderless to me. And even now with, with the England losing and seeing all the vitriol and all the hate that comes up, uh, against black players and black people it makes you shrink away from embracing the only country you've ever really known as a home um, and I can take a train through the Yorkshire Dales and think oh my god it's so beautiful I love being from Yorkshire I love being from here and then you know in the next incident feel very rejected and like I just want to leave so I think emotionally the ideas of borders um has always been very present in my life and how I think about my identity. Um, legally, the idea of borders, the idea of lands being divided at the Berlin Conference, the idea of um, ethnic groups being clubbed together just because it was convenient from a colonialist point of view, the idea of Britain needing the Caribbean and the so-called Commonwealth after the war and then vehemently rejecting people from like the 60s onwards and saying no actually we don't need you now you're disposable and being disposable because of where they're from so there's all these different reasons as to why a border is contentious and um i read a book earlier in the year the sovereign individual and it's more from an economic standpoint but it's talking about how the nation state was formed and how nations will start to disintegrate in the information age as well um so there's so many there's so many like theoretical, um, moral, economic reasons why a border should be challenged and um, not just in the African diaspora, but I think there's not, a, there's not a nation on earth that's not troubled by the history of their borders, how they were formed and how they're being enforced at the moment. So um, why, why should we, I don't think we should stop asking those questions about why we should have them. I mean, Brexit, my God, there's so many. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, even for this work, um, we really struggled to get some transducers because of Brexit and the new taxes and stuff. And there's a real shortage of different materials as a, as a person that's making work with wood and different technologies. And, you know, just because a border has changed its hardness or its softness. So, yeah. Yeah. And um, that, that kind of frustrating arbitrariness to um, the way that our bodies and our lived experience are constantly subjected to the violence of borders. And then, of course, the potential that artists like you show us um, in terms of how we can um, hearken back to information and uh, to traditions that already exist, but also um, to use new technologies in order to be able to mount a real challenge. Um, so. I think that's all uh, very potent and very present in your work. Um, and but how also do you see the body, the the kind of physical embodied uh, presence, as a fundamental element of your practice? Um, I I think it's I think it's always been something quite 
inherent or intrinsic that I don't actually think I've spent so much time thinking about because um, I've just I've I've built a language I think like I grew up in a black Pentecostal church and um, it wasn't unusual on a Sunday to see people become filled with the Holy Ghost and run and jump and scream and shout or dance Um, and there are a lot of languages to do with the body whether it's um, facial expressions to communicate something or or mannerisms that that enact something that's not that's intangible that's more spiritual maybe so I definitely see the body as a vessel a vessel for thought and action um and spirit um or soul or or emotion however you want to describe it um and so it's something that always has to be present um but how it's present and why it's present are the, the factors that change so um there are people in that might come into return and they just see it as a really fun thing as some children did at the weekend. Um, and then there's other people that come in and they're very haunted by the audio and the content, um, but they're experiencing it through their body. Um, there's people who will never physically visit the work, but it'll give them a hair raising feel- feeling or a sense of joy within their body. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm rambling a bit now, but that it's <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's it's always present because I'm using people's bodies effectively to to impact change or to affect some kind of influence within the installations. Um, to what end they're being used is it's partly up to them, partly up to me as the maker of the environment that they're entering. So it's it's just it's always a collaboration with your work. There's always uh, some sense that the audience is an activating factor and that's something I really appreciate. And um, this work sits within a a body that, or sits within a kind of um, wider sphere that has a a specific influence. And um, what I'm referring to is Elmina Castle in Ghana. Um, So, it, this seems to be a, a, a monument, a, a, a sort of um, real physical, um, what am I trying to say? A, a sort of edifice, uh, a, this building, this thing uh, that's coming into greater and greater awareness. And um, it's something that I never learned about, learning about slavery in school. And yet, um, when we look at the work of Saida Hartman in uh, Lose Your Mother, um, as well as uh, Selena Tompkins' uh, work Salt, which uh, I hope to show a a kind of image from that a little bit later. Um, But your visit as well to Elmina Castle really influenced uh, how you were thinking in the production of Return. so is there anything that you can say about that in terms of um, maybe the idea of pilgrimage or the way that what you called a, an ambiguous aspect of your history came over into return? Yeah, I think so I've, I've visited twice now um, and also visited um, Cape Coast Castle the last time I was in Ghana. Um, and it's a very strange relationship because if I didn't know, if I if I just happened upon the location and I didn't know why it was there or how my history related to it, I probably wouldn't feel anything. Um, it's in the presence of the information that that physical location is transformed um, and then builds a significance. Um, yes, you can see the absolute like abject circumstances that people must have inhabited even if you were the only person in the cell it's a terrible place to reside for any amount of time not to mention if you're one of a thousand people in a certain square footage of space um when I was growing up my parents we used to go to like African Saturday school and we'd they'd they'd have books and you know they were coming out of like 70s 80s back awareness kind of yeah, exactly. <laughs> Black awareness kind of mentality. And but also like I think from a more recent history, they were they'd come to England and they've been told all sorts of nonsense about why 
coming from Jamaica and they'd had to build a resilience about there and a protectionist protectionist attitude about their identity and that's what they passed on to myself and my siblings and so we did a lot of reading and we watched different documentaries and all of this information was fine um and I knew it and it did sadden me but it wasn't until I physically went to Almina Castle that um it became a bit of a reality and I thought actually no this is this is great great whatever oh snap this is in my bloodline um and it, it did transform the information so the combination of the physical place and the records and the stories um built up its significance quite a lot for me sorry I was a little bit remiss I I uh, maybe should explain Elmina Castle in Ghana is one of the places where uh, people who were abducted from uh, from the West Coast of Africa, but also further inland, uh, were taken and held before they were sold into slavery and uh, shipped to other parts of what's now the African diaspora. And so this is a really kind of a significant piece of architecture in terms of uh, the history of enslaved people and, um, and these very gruesome economies that came out of this. Um, so maybe at this point, um, I'll show an image and, um, and a little bit of text uh, from text that was referred to by the uh, show Salt by Selena Tompkins. And so I'm going to see if it is nice and simple to share my screen. Okay, looks like, um, looks like that worked. So uh, Salt is a show by Selena Thompson, uh, who's an absolutely brilliant uh, performer. I was completely so taken by this work, which was also, um, like Akila's work, uh, very much research informed and, um, and informed by a journey within the transatlantic slave triangle. Uh, so uh, what we can see on screen at the moment, on the left of the screen, there's an image of a black woman in a white dress with protective goggles on, uh, beating a large block of salt with a sledgehammer and um, the debris of the salt just kind of shattering all around her. Uh, and at the top of the image, there's a neon triangle that's a reference to uh, the route that slavers used to uh, capture and enslave people in Africa and to bring them to the Caribbean and North America. And it kind of would continue uh, in this horrible triangle. Um, so to make this piece, uh, Selena and another collaborator traveled on a container ship uh, along the slave triangle. And, um, and the work that came out of this journey uh, ended up being one of the most poignant pieces of theater I've seen maybe ever. Um, but on the website for SALT, Selena has placed um, this piece of text as a little bit of an epigram. And so I'll just go ahead and read that out. Um, this epigram is from a book called Meditating uh, by Jinananda, who's a, a Buddhist um, meditation practitioner and teacher. So the quote, where our real home is might be tricky to say. In a way, that is the point. Some people say that is the body, but I think the body is more a channel that leads us home. Ultimate reality is our home. It is here and now, and not in some special piece of what is happening. We imagine that we are on a journey, that life is a journey, but we are home from the beginning. That is not an easy thing to accept. And so I wanted to um, bring this in, um, first of all, because we're both admirers of Selena and of this work in particular. Um, I also want to encourage viewers to um, go to Selena's website 
and to the page dedicated to SALT. And through that, you can also check out the SALT reading list um, that provides loads of references to uh, not just the books, but also um, the different music, um, Twitter handles for Selena's um, uh, various influences. Uh, it's, it's just a tremendous resource. And um, one of the things in common, um, besides this notion of, um, of the journey, these notions of home and the body, uh, is also the research intensivity of the work as well. Um, so I'm going to just hand back over to you, Akila, and see um, if there are any of these same themes that you want to kind of uh, pick up and draw out as we discuss your work. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think the research intensivity, there's something um, kind of dual happening, I find, where you're reading, you're reading different writers, fictional and um, factual, you're coming across different expressions that people have made, and looking at how other artists and makers and thinkers have learned to deal with this, this relationship across the Atlantic. Um, and it's it's kind of like the only comfort and the only space available to somebody as a diaspora member because um, yes, you can physically go to Elmina, but actually that place doesn't embody what it is to be stateless, what it is to live in exile in the place of your birth, what it is to have family that's disconnected from you in different places. And so I think we're constantly trying to create a place to be. And even if you're looking at like, earlier artists like Sun Ra or um, other novelists like Peter Abrams and the view from Kayabu when he's like tracing um, generationally how people are shifting and where they ended up and how the nations are changing. Um, I feel like it's, it's, it's this constant ebb and flow of creation um, that will probably, I don't know, maybe one, one day after we've lived somewhere for eight more generations, this might not be an issue, but it's really hard to imagine that at the moment. And um, I, th I think when in the making of Return, it's looking at the same issue, really. It's like, where can you where can you rest your mind? Where can you rest your heart when when you look to the past for solace? All you find is difficulty and um, more ambiguity and even bigger wealth of unanswered questions and, you know, untraceable genealogy. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of emotions in, within that. And I think a lot of these works are very emotional because um, as many facts and figures as you accumulate, it doesn't, it doesn't make any marks towards rectifying, healing, coming to terms with or grips with the emotions that are stirred by a history like this. Um, and so return is by no means concrete um, or um, an antidote. It's, it's literally just another creation, another space to like, ruminate about these things and hopefully find some kind of solace about them. That's, that's mega. That's really, um, that's really an intense reflection. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that um, this question about uh, the relationship between facts and emotion um, is a nice segue into um, another kind of reference point that I thought about uh, when I was encountering Return, which is uh, forensic architecture. Um, and so uh, forensic architecture, for those who don't know, um, are um, a research agency based at Goldsmiths University of London, investigating human rights violations, including violence committed by states, police forces, militaries, and corporations. Forensic architecture works in partnership with institutions across civil society, from grassroots uh, activists to legal teams, to international NGOs and media organizations, to carry out investigations with and on behalf of communities and individuals affected by conflict, police brutality, border regimes, 
and environmental violence. Apologies to the captioners and to Laura, who's interpreting for my mega fast recitation there. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and so, Akila, I, I believe that, um, that there are some overlaps here in terms of uh, your use of data and the idea of um, sort of wanting to play with this relationship between like facts and objectivity on one hand and like emotion, uh, storytelling, mythology, um, hopefully like empathy and connection. Um, so is there anything that you want to kind of speak to there? Definitely. I think um, in terms of forensic architecture, where people are reconstructing um, to establish facts of what happened of an event, um, I do feel there is a parallel with what I'm doing, in particular with the point clouds and the traces of the body that we're generating in the installation. Um, when, when I first thought about doing the body traces, um, it was kind of inspired or instigated by looking at the slave records and you, you've got all these numbers, like approximately 12 million transported, millions more died just on the journey to be transported. Um, and it, 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 there are all these numbers that uh, the average human mind struggles to visualize, comprehend, understand the weight of it. Um, and I was trying to find a way to make those numbers a bit more concrete, relevant, um, interpretable to people. And so I had this idea that as each person uses the installation and their body is traced, they become that trace of their, of their personal body becomes uh, something that maybe stands in the gap of all those numbers. So if 12 million people use the installation, we have 12 many, million body traces that kind of replaces the bodies that were lost in the middle passage, um, renamed, redistributed, uh, abused in many different horrific ways. And does not that it remedies what was what happened, but it just gives us a way to hold the weight of those bodies because they've kind of disappeared into history. Um, they haven't because we are obviously descendants, but you know, in terms of where they sit in history and how you hold it conceptually, it's very difficult. Um, it's it's and, absolutely yeah. difficult, and it and it's tremendously vexed. And one of the things that I really appreciate about. Um, how this work manages to work with both numbers and um, and like the embodied presence of a history is that you're not reproducing the drama of brutality mm. um, in order to make this connection. Um, mm -hmm. I feel that what you're doing is is something that's so much more of a kind of sophisticated translation mm -hmm. process. And I mean, there's not really a question in that. It's, it was more of a, um, more just praise. So oh, thank uh, you. <laughs> you. You can come back to that if you, if you like. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think for, um, as, as somebody with slavery in my heritage and as somebody who has received negative comments from European people about having slave heritage, but also native African people about having slave heritage, I'm not necessarily it's like, I don't need to drag it back up. I think it should be taught and I think people should learn about it. But in terms of needing to get into the, the, the ins and outs of it, for me to experience rage or, or hurt or anger, it, it's there. Like, <laughs> it's okay, we don't need to go over it. Um, and so I think that's, that's my position in the work that um, not only do we have that historical events to be sad about, but we have the, the impacts and the lasting legacies of them in the present day that we experience that, you know, having conversations with people in 2019 and they're talking about things being post-racial and then 2020 having a very, I won't go over it, but we're having a very like rude awakening for a lot of people who thought we were past that. Um, I don't think if I'm making this installation for African diaspora people primarily to have a space, we don't need to go back into how hard it is to be black or how hard it was to be black we're kind of aware and so it's like moving on from that point what do we do and what can we do together and what do we need together um within a work like this um 
Yeah, and again, that's how the collaborative comes back in because I won't be making it alone. And, you know, if nobody goes to use it, the work doesn't exist. So, um, yeah. yeah. Maybe this would be a good moment to uh, consider a question that's popped up in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, so our questioner asks, uh, or our, our questioner begins by saying, um, I enjoy your thoughts about bodily experience and the changing experience uh, that can have depending on context. It made me wonder about how we carry personal and collective trauma in our bodies on a deeply somatic level. I wonder what your thoughts are on the experience of our bodies being seen in art, literally followed by light, and how it might help to unravel the idea of a need re uh, needed resilience and cementing the development of personal fortitude. It's a beautiful question. Mm. It's a really beautiful question. Um, I think when when I first started to think about trauma, um, gen generational, inherited, genetic, and present day, and how the return project could seek to um, not necessarily cure, but provide a space for that trauma to be exercised in some way or another. Um, I just had some therapy for a car accident that I was in um, and I've completely forgotten the name of the therapy but basically you're, you go through the experience with the therapist and you have lights in front of you and you, your eyes and your hands are following these lights and it's in basically it's using your using your senses to occupy your your frontal lobe or the, the more present day part of your brain brain so that you can file away that traumatic memory in your long-term memory area of your brain. And it doesn't feel as present and as real anymore. And some of the anxiety and the stress and the trauma of that memory can start to exist in the past as opposed to following you around in the present. Um, and when I, when I started making the installation, installation and I was thinking, if we're going to be thinking about the trauma of, and the impacts of slavery and colonialism, um, how could the senses begin to be occupied and augmented so that we can start to file that experience away, not to forget it, but um, so that the heat that rises in your chest when you're confronted with uh, a difficult experience, a difficult history, a difficult present day, doesn't need to overwhelm you, consume you. Um, and yeah, I think that's a really beautiful question. It's definitely one that's going to continue to be answered as the work develops. Um, that, that's that's where the work is in in terms of where the work is at right now. That's kind of what it's thinking about in the lights and the vibrations and how the body is occupied whilst we're looking at this quite traumatic um, history and connections between us. I think that's really important, and the question of uh, how representation can re-traumatize people uh, and how much we can and should be expected to bear uh, mm. these kind of repetitive images and is there not a different way or and indeed a, a more effective way of mm -hmm. getting towards the emotionality behind artistic intent uh, in revisiting these histories through artwork and so mm. I, I was really stoked with your answer there. Um, the uh, final body of work that I wanted to look at with relation to return uh, comes from the um, US-based uh, photographer and visual artist, uh, Nona Faustine. Um, I, love a number of Faustine's uh, series. And I really appreciate some of the resonances of uh, her influences, such as Lorna Simpson uh, and Carrie Mae Weems. So, but I've, I found uh, this piece particularly, or this body, uh, this series, White Shoes, um, particularly relevant in this discussion. Um, and so, uh, Faustine writes in a, an artist statement uh, that accompanied 
the exhibition of white shoes. Uh, situated inside a photographic tradition while questioning the culture that bred that tradition, my work walks the line between the past and the present. My work starts where intersecting identities meet history. The self-portraits are complex explorations that put them in dialogue with the daguerreotypes of slaves in South Carolina from 1850. And so um, what we can see on the screen are uh, just two of the images from the White Shoes series, uh, both from 2013. Uh, the image on the left is a, a photograph, it's a self-portrait of Faustine, uh, who is a black woman with uh, short cropped uh, black hair. Uh, she's photographed from behind. Uh, she's only wearing a pair of white pumps and um, and these kind of white high-heeled shoes uh, are consistent in the series uh, and she's walking the stairs of a courthouse in New York City. Uh, the image on the right uh, shows um, Faustine as well, uh, another self-portrait. Um, she's nude and standing in the same white shoes on a wooden block uh, in the middle of a street that happens to be Wall Street in New York City. Um, in the background, you can see uh, the kind of big New York skyscrapers and um, several cars um, showing that she's standing in traffic. Um, and there is indeed a, a kind of yellow cab that sort of has to swerve around her in order to avoid hitting her where she is. Um, so, there's so much uh, power in the the notion of the self-portrait, but also um, the way that the histories of slavery in New York City are kind of uh, revivified uh, and made live when actually we, we don't tend to associate New York and the north of the United States with slavery at all. Um, but this is a, a way of showing that um, Wall Street has blood on its hands, um, the urban and not just the rural has blood on, it, blood on its hands and, um, and that the present does as well. Um, and I, I especially just wanna point out the way that the image on the left, um, the, the figure in the image just has these clenched fists and is climbing these stairs with such force and power. Um, there's something intensely uh, both sculptural and dynamic about it, but also the way that the, the stairs that she's climbing have this, um, this drip um, and this, this sense that they've been washed. Um, so this was just something that I wanted to bring into the, this conversation about how liveness and embodiedness, um, can sort of activate history in really effective ways that I think that you're doing with your work as well. Yeah, I love this work. Um, I visited the African-American burial ground in New York and, um, you know, heard about New York, Broadway, seeing movies, um, never heard of that history prior to visiting the museum. Um, and yeah, I think what she does there is brilliant in the way that it confronts and not just shines a light, but I think it makes, it makes the history very active um, in a way that a list of figures and numbers and addresses can't. And it brings that emotion to it. Um, and that realness of it as well, because it's very easy to keep your distance from 12 million people. It's very difficult to keep your distance to a living, breathing body now situated within that history. Um, so whether or not you claim that history, you feel a connection to it through her and through the action that she's taking. Absolutely, because the, the history of slavery and the afterlife of slavery uh, has, it belongs to uh, those of us with um, mm -hmm. the, the heritage of enslaved people. Um, but it doesn't just belong to us and it needs yeah. no longer to only be our burden to bear. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so I think that we are just about at time. <laughs> and um, so I, I wonder, Akila, if, um, if there's anything else that you want to bring into the conversation before we hand back over to Jane for some final thoughts? Um, I'd, I'd first like to thank you for your questions, for the references that you've made, um, and for the opportunity to think this through with you, because it is a work in progress. Um, and to mention that there is a website for the project, return-project.org. Hyphen, hyphen, return um, and as it develops, hopefully next year, we'll be doing an international launch with two sites um, happening, most likely in the UK and in West Africa, that will be connected, that will be interactive, and people in those places will be able to use the installation. Um, but yeah, Jane? Swadida, <laughs> thank you both so much um, for your really powerful, informative and moving discussion this evening. Susan, thank you for your really in-depth insights and reflections uh, on themes within Akila's work. And Akila, thank you for so openly um, sharing your ideas, your personal history and uh, revealing about the collaborative processes within your work. I've learned so much. Um, thank you both. It was fascinating. I just wanted to let everyone know that, um, as you mentioned, Akili, your project is running until the 1st of August at Yorkshire Sculpture Park. I think hopefully you're going to be around for quite a lot of the time, Akila. I know you're, as you said, capturing people's responses to the work. The work's open every Saturday and Sunday up until the Sunday, the 1st of August. And also to let you know that um, Ashley Holmes is commission at Leeds Art Gallery. Just End is opening on Saturday, the 24th of July. And Shazad Darwood's um, new work is going to be premiering at Yorkshire Sculpture Park um, as a special event on Sunday, the 1st of August. So that's what we've coming up. I also wanted to thank Will Simpson so much for running the AV so smoothly behind the scenes this evening. Done a great job. And also Laura Phillips, thank you for the great BSL tonight. And thank you, Bo. We can't see you, but thank you for your captions as well. So that's it for us tonight. Thank you, everybody. Um, this will be the talk will be available um, on our website. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.